Our topic is atrial fibrillation, a presentation I've developed with my patients in mind, hundreds of patients with atrial fibrillation who we treat. Um, goal to help each person understand what exactly atrial fibrillation is, what our concerns are, and what treatment options are available, and how we'll apply each of those treatment options to each individual to get the best response for that person, the best result for that person. So our topic is atrial fibrillation for patients and families, all your options, everything you need to know. A number of industry disclosures to be aware of. This is a broad informational topic. Um, the treatment of each individual patient is between that patient and their doctor. So this is informational presentation to make you aware of what options are available, hopefully to enhance your discussion with your provider, or should you choose to seek us for your medical care um, as a prelude to our discussion about your individual case. What is atrial fibrillation? Tricky question. Here we see a schematic of a heart which is presently having normal sinus rhythm, so a perfectly normal heart rhythm. We know that the heart rhythm initiates in the top chambers of the heart, spreads across those chambers to then engage the bottom main pumping chambers of the heart, which then contract, pumping the blood to the body. So it's this electrical signal that coordinates on the pumping chambers. On a rhythm strip or on an ECG, we will see the signal for the top chamber contracting, and then for the bottom chamber contracting, then the bottom chamber recovers, we have a pause, and then top, bottom, recover, top, bottom, recover, and that's a normal heart rhythm. In atrial fibrillation, we have very chaotic electrical activity occurring in those top chambers. It's very much like a series of cyclones or hurricanes in the electrical activity, and as a result, those chambers don't contract uniformly. They sort of quiver or in a standstill, the impulses that are occurring in these top chambers bombard the lower chambers such that the lower chambers now contract as before in an irregular fashion, in a rapid and irregular fashion. Irregular because the activity that is occurring in the top chambers is engaging the bottom chambers in an irregular fashion. And here we see a rhythm strip from a patient in atrial fibrillation and you see the pattern of main pumping chamber contraction and you can tell that that's sort of grossly irregular indicating that that patient has the rhythm of atrial fibrillation, which is controlling their overall heart rate. So this is the condition that um, we are addressing today. How do you diagnose an atrial fibrillation? This is best diagnosed in your doctor's office with an electrocardiogram. So here we see a gentleman having his electrocardiogram recorded. There are stickers on his arms and his legs and across his chest, and this strip of heart rhythm activity is recorded. And we can see, like we saw on the previous slide, that the heart rhythm is rapid, it's irregular, it is irregularly irregular, and that's how we recognize um, atrial fibrillation. Between the main pumping chamber activations, we see that irregular disorganized activity that is occurring in the top chambers of the heart in this patient with atrial fibrillation. So you can ask the question, do I have atrial fibrillation? That's a good question. Symptoms from atrial fibrillation can be non-existent to severe. Everybody is so different. The sensation of palpitations is the classic symptom of atrial fibrillation. This is where you feel a rapid fluttering or pounding sensation in your chest, or you simply feel out of rhythm, which is the phrase that patients find to describe how they feel. Most commonly, atrial fibrillation simply causes fatigue, and that fatigue tends to parallel the duration of the atrial fibrillation episodes. And it's like you're running an, a marathon that never quite stops, and as a result, people find that they develop a significant, even a debilitating fatigue due to their atrial fibrillation. Our patients also complain of shortness of breath. Despite how severe the symptoms of atrial fibrillation can be, we recognize that in certain individuals there really are no symptoms. The person's heart is going very fast, it's irregular, and the person insists that they are not bothered by this, they don't feel any different, thank you very much, and not aware of the arrhythmia, can't tell. 
I tend to suspect in those people that there is a component of unrecognized fatigue that they're not appreciating because they've been in that rhythm for so long. Nevertheless, we have to recognize that this person is not frankly bothered um, by the condition of atrial fibrillation. So here this gentleman is asking, am I in atrial fibrillation? Is that funny feeling that I have actually my atrial fibrillation? We know in general that symptoms are unreliable. 95% of atrial fibrillation episodes are in fact asymptomatic, meaning the individual can't tell that it has occurred. Suspicious symptoms are incorrectly attributed to atrial fibrillation 85% of the time. So a lot of those little twinges or funny feelings that you may experience are not in fact atrial fibrillation. And even in individuals who are known to have symptomatic episodes of atrial fibrillation, we know they have the real thing. These people will have asymptomatic episodes 12 times more frequently. So welcome to the smoke and mirrors of atrial fibrillation. Do I have it? Yes, I do. Sometimes, am I having it now? Maybe, maybe not. When I don't think I have it, am I in fact having it? Possibly. It becomes very difficult to predict. Those who tend to overestimate atrial fibrillation are individuals who tend to be anxious or have anxiety, and also those who are depressed. Classically, the patients who underestimate their atrial fibrillation have advanced age and female gender. So we're kind of aware of those differences when we, when we interview our patients. Whether you can feel it or not, atrial fibrillation has serious consequences. There's a five-fold increased risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation accounts for 36% of strokes in patients age 80 to 89 years. And these strokes are more disabling, they are more likely to recur, and more likely to be fatal than strokes due to other causes. There's a three-fold increased risk of heart failure, two-fold increased risk of a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, and a two-fold increased risk of developing dementia or early mortality. So very significant atrial fibrillation and something that we have to be very cognizant of. And you wonder why these strokes occur. This diagram um, shows just how easily that process can take place. In the top chambers of your heart, we have atrial fibrillation. These chambers aren't contracting. As a result, the blood has opportunity to stand still. When it stands still, blood clots form. Those blood clots are then passed to the main pumping chambers of the heart, which get pumped to the body, but also directly to the brain where those clots can lodge in the brain, block arteries to the brain, cause infarct or death of regions of your brain, which is in fact a stroke. And um, we see just how vulnerable the circulatory system is and your brain is um, because of its close proximity from a blood vessel point of view um, to the heart itself. It's about this time that patients ask me, so what causes atrial fibrillation anyways? That's a very challenging question in point of fact, and it's different for every individual, and it's hard to predict exactly what causes atrial fibrillation in any one person. However, we know that there are risk factors, high blood pressure, obesity, sleep apnea, being hyperthyroid or having a history of alcohol or drug use can cause some fibrosis or scarring in the chambers of the heart, some dilatation, some ischemia where the heart is suffering a little bit from lack of oxygen. There can be infiltration of scar proteins into the tissues of the heart. All of these changes sort of make the top chambers electrically unstable and predisposed to um, atrial fibrillation. We know the more you, atrial fibrillation you have, the more you tend to have it. This rhythm tends to um, propen pro um, increase its own likelihood of recurrence. We know that inflammation and oxidative stresses throughout our bodies, air pollution, things like this, contribute to the atrial fibrillation substrate. And any collection of these things in any one individual can in fact give this rhythm. How do these complex rhythms sustain themselves? is a very interesting question. That was the topic of my PhD um, back in the day at McGill University in 2002. And here is an image from my major publication from my thesis uh, occurring on the cover of this cardiac journal where we were trying to answer that question of how complex rhythms sustain themselves. That question is not relevant to you. The question is, do I have it or not? And if I do have it, how can we best treat me for atrial fibrillation to minimize the consequences and give me the best chance of maintaining a normal rhythm. 
So it's a huge problem and it's growing quickly. Over three million people in the United States right now have atrial fibrillation. That will be over 12 million by the year 2050, and that's because our population is aging. 5% of the population over age 65, 10% over age 75 will have atrial fibrillation. It's becoming the latest epidemic, very much like high blood pressure or diabetes. Uh, atrial fibrillation is increasing among us very quickly. So you say, if it's so common in advanced ages, and if patients can't tell if they have it or not, why don't we screen everybody to see if they have atrial fibrillation that they aren't yet recognized, recognizing? And in fact, that study has been done, and a result has shown that a single ECG or pulse check would detect atrial fibrillation in 1.4% of the population age 65 and above who have never had atrial fibrillation diagnosed previously. So we suspect that there is a large number of unrecognized cases for those of you who have an iPhone, you can use this monitor which you attach to your phone and that's able to measure your heart rhythm and diagnose atrial fibrillation. And in fact, this was studied at 10 community pharmacies, 1,000 customers age 65 and above in Australia and by recording 30 to 60 seconds of heart rhythm activity in those individuals, they identified atrial fibrillation in 1.5% of the people screen. screen. Most of these patients had no symptoms Despite no symptoms in the presence of atrial fibrillation, we recognize that there is a significant risk of stroke in these individuals, which they need to be aware of. So understanding your atrial fibrillation, this brings us to continuous heart rhythm monitoring. How are you going to know at any one point if you have it? Well, you need some kind of monitoring device that can tell you. In our clinic, this is usually what we start with. It's an ambulatory monitor, can be worn up to 30 days. Here we see this gentleman putting it on. It's three stickers to your chest with electrodes that attach to a hip pack, and you can wear that for as long as 30 days, and after that period, um, we will receive this report that says we are looking for atrial fibrillation. This monitor was worn for 30 days, and this individual, we found atrial fibrillation in 3.1% of the time this rhythm was present. The patient had symptoms, they triggered the monitor, and that the symptoms in fact correlated to very rapidly conducting atrial fibrillation. And indeed, if you wonder if the monitor is estimating that 3.1% correctly, it will give you representative tracings that you can visually confirm. And they're exceedingly accurate. So this is a good snapshot of what some person may experience from their heart rhythm over an extended period of time. The question then becomes, if we treat you, say we change a medication or you adjust your lifestyle, how much did you improve on your atrial fibrillation? Well, that means we need to monitor you again, and um, that becomes a challenge. Here's new technologies for these short-term monitoring um, systems on the order of several weeks. These function like large Band-Aid patches. You can stick them over your heart. They'll continuously record your heart rhythm, add up all the atrial fibrillation you're having. If you have a symptom, you can simply push the button on the device and it will record whatever your heart's doing at that time and it will report it to us. Um, so we have these very powerful short-term um, monitoring options. But you say, I want to know all the time, and I want to know how effective my treatments are as we adjust medications, as I make lifestyle changes. And this brings us to long-term monitors. Here is a, a monitor which is good for three years. It's a Medtronic product. It's called the Link. We can simply insert this under your skin, right over top of your heart. It will sense your heart continuously and add up and report to us all the atrial fibrillation that you have over three years. So as we change treatments, we can tell exactly how successful we are in reducing or eradicating your atrial fibrillation. And we use these monitors extensively. I'm the highest implanter in Washington State and about top 10 um, in the United States at present for the use of this monitor. And that's because we're managing so many patients with um, atrial fibrillation. And here is some, a picture from our procedure. Inserting that monitor, um, we, use this we use this insertion tool. You can see the device is loaded in this cartridge. We advance this probe just under the skin. The goal is to keep it very superficial. And then here's the monitor. We just, with a plunger, we just slip it under the skin, remove the loading device, you go home 30 minutes later with a drop of surgical glue, 
Um, this literally takes us 30 seconds to implant, and the information that we receive is, is fantastic. So here we see what that insertion may look immediately after the insertion. This is the surgical line sealed with a drop of, drop of glue. And two weeks later, we can see just how well that is already healing. And visually, you can't see the monitor. Looking at this person, you couldn't tell that they have one. If he were to feel his chest, he could indeed feel that it was present. Um, but it should not bother that individual at all. And it is collecting um, data for us continuously you get a bedside transmitter system that sits next to your bed, um, a garage door opening type device where you can click over your monitor to report symptoms. And every time that happens, then every 24 hours when the data transmits, we have a report that is delivered to us electronically and we know exactly what is happening um, with your heart rhythm. So we classify atrial fibrillation then based on the duration of the episodes. If your episodes last less than seven days, we call that paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. If the episodes last seven days or more, that's then termed persistent. If it's a year or more for a single episode, we call that long standing. And finally, we'll term your atrial fibrillation as permanent if we decide we're not gonna try any longer to keep you in normal rhythm. We've attempted everything, we can't do it. We've decided that we're just gonna control the risk of stroke, not try to keep you in normal rhythm, then we term that atrial fibrillation as permanent. So what can be done for um, atrial fibrillation? We really have this management triad, three priorities in any one patient. Our first priority is stroke prevention to avoid and prevent this devastating complication. We then look at rate control, which is when you're having atrial fibrillation, can we control your overall heart rate so that rhythm bothers you as little as possible? And then finally, rhythm control strategy. Can we stop atrial fibrillation and prevent it from recurring, maintaining you in a normal heart rhythm? That is a, what a rhythm control strategy refers to. So we'll start by talking about stroke prevention. How do we prevent strokes? We know that anticoagulation with a blood thinning medication is the best and only way to prevent strokes due to atrial fibrillation. And when somebody is adequately on a blood thinner, their stroke risk is really similar to that of the general population. So the protection we provide can in fact be very good. Question is, do you need blood thinners for atrial fibrillation? And we decide that um, using a risk scoring system that's based on your medical history um, patients get a point for a history of congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, two points for age above 75, a point for diabetes, two for prior stroke, any vascular disease, age above 65, and also female gender is a risk factor. Total maximal score of nine. So you simply add this up for an individual, and then we go to a chart like this, where for each of those scores, we can estimate what the annual risk of stroke would be without blood thinners. And then depending on your stroke, risk, and the duration of atrial fibrillation episodes that you are experiencing will decide whether you need aspirin therapy or a stronger blood thinner. Historically, that was only warfarin. Now we have agents like Xeralto, Eliquis, Cervasa, Pradaxa. Excellent options, simplifies the anticoagulation process tremendously, provides patients with excellent protection with reduced complication risks um, from the blood thinners. In spite of all the negative commercials on television, um, these really are phenomenal new medications and we are exceedingly grateful for them. So again, warfarin. How many of us have ever been on warfarin? There's a few. Warfarin is effective, it's inexpensive. You can use it for hemodialysis and mechanical valves. Disadvantages are it takes several days to start. There's an increased bleeding risk. We have to monitor our warfarin levels to keep our INR two to three, as you know, and there's problems. The time that you actually are INR two to three is what we call your time in therapeutic range that's about 60% of the time. When your INR is too low, you're not protected. When it's too high, you have an excessive bleeding risk. I, um, warfarin is very sensitive to your diet. Spinach, broccoli, green leafy vegetables really influence warfarin. New medications influence warfarin. And we want you to eat spinach and broccoli because it's good for you. And when it just messes up your INR, that can become um, very frustrating. 
in the last several years, we now have available to us these oral anticoagulants, Xeralto Eliquis, Cevesa, Pradaxa. They do, they're as good as warfarin. Their protection begins immediately after the first dose. There's less bleed risk than with warfarin, particularly less serious bleeds like brain bleeds. There's no monitoring that is necessary. There is the possibility of reversibility. So if you came into the emergency room and you had a significant bleed and we had to stop the blood thinning medication, there are things we can do to reverse it. And soon on the horizons, we will have actual antidotes where we can completely reverse that blood thinning medication should we need to. And um, that's something that's never been available to us even with warfarin. These treat other things like deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism. Some disadvantages are that at present they are more expensive. Sometimes they're associated with an increased risk of a GI bleed. It's a trade-off we tend to make. Um, also then if you miss a dose because they're in and out of your system so fast, you can lose protection. So we have to be certain that we take these things um, very regularly and on time. So that's stroke prevention, very important. Beyond that, we first think about rate control. When you're having atrial fibrillation, we don't want your heart to race excessively, uh, so we take efforts to slow it down. Ideally, rate control would maintain your heart rate less than 80 beats a minute when you're at rest, although even less than 110 is permissible. How do we slow the heart down? We first of all, medical optimization. We treat other conditions. Other things that are stressing your body will tend to speed up your atrial fibrillation and we do the best we can to remove these stressors so that um, we have our best chance of actually controlling atrial fibrillation. Usually we start with beta blockers. These are like giant lozenges for the heart. We're familiar with medications like metoprolol or propranolol and carvedilol. Calcium blockers further slow the heart, deltaism, cardiism. Some of us are on digoxin, which can get you an extra 10 beats per minute in um, rate slowing. So we're very familiar with these medications. Most of our AFib patients are on beta blockers and probably also at least a calcium channel blocker if they're struggling at all with rate control. Here's what rate control would look like on one of our cardiac monitors. Here's a 65-year-old female. She has highly symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. She's been implanted with that link monitor that I showed you. And here is her clinical data, 92 days total. These are what her heart rates are when she is in normal rhythm. She spends most of her time, as you can see, in the 70 to 80 beat per minute range, goes up to 100, a little bit beyond. This is the profile of somebody who's very healthy and active. During those 92 days, she spent a total of one day in atrial fibrillation. And you can see her heart rates during atrial fibrillation. These are not well controlled. Most of the time, she's above 110, even above 140 beats a minute, going very fast. So we say that's poor rate control, we have a lot of work to do to slow her heart down when she is having the atrial fibrillation. And this is the topic of rate control. Beyond rate control, we talk about rhythm control. What are our options for keeping you in normal rhythm and preventing atrial fibrillation altogether? Beyond the rate controlling medications, now we're entering on the territory of antiarrhythmic medications. Agents like flecainide or propafenone are effective, they're inexpensive. You have to have a relatively normal heart structurally without evidence of blocked arteries. But when that's true, these can be very safe and effective and started on an outpatient basis. Other medications include sotalol, also effective and inexpensive. For these ones, you have to have normal kidney function, not because it's toxic to your kidneys, but because you pee it out. And we have to think that maybe these medications would prolong some of your electrical intervals, and so we have to monitor for those when we start them. Dofetilide is one of my favorites. That's what I re reach for when patients have persistent, continuous atrial fibrillation. They're very symptomatic. They really need to get out of it. Um, that drug consistently works miracles for us. And um, in my population, it's one that I reach for um, not infrequently. Once we have exhausted our options with medications, if control is still not complete, we can proceed to a catheter ablation procedure for atrial fibrillation. When we do this procedure, this is a rhythm control strategy. We're trying to get you and keep you in normal rhythm. It's also a symptom control strategy. 
We're trying to control your heart racing, your palpitations, your fatigue, and your heart failure. And it's the severity of symptoms that tell us how strongly we will recommend a procedure of this nature. For that person who's entirely asymptomatic, this is probably not appropriate. For that person who is really bothered by their atrial fibrillation, despite our best medical therapy, it's very appropriate. And here's a picture when we started our program. This is us in our electrophysiology lab with a patient on the table here. We have our monitoring equipment, our fluoroscopy camera, and we are in the process of performing an ablation for, for atrial fibrillation. And it's very, that's very much what the setup um, would look like for you if you were ever to have an ablation procedure um, at our facility. So rhythm control this business of rhythm control. Here we see a monitor again of that 65-year-old female, highly symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. She is having these infrequent episodes as the months go by, October, November, December. Um, we see that she's having several hours per day intermittently of atrial fibrillation. We do her ablation at this time, several episodes subsequently, and then nothing complete freedom from atrial fibrillation following that procedure, indicating the success of that rhythm control strategy in stopping atrial fibrillation and relieving her from that um, very bothersome rhythm. So who are our candidates for an ablation? We have a class one indication, the greenest light in that person who is symptomatic, they're still in that paroxysmal pattern, and they've tried at least one antiarrhythmic medication. If you have not tried that antiarrhythmic medication or you're in a persistent pattern, we still have a green light, but it's starting to turn yellow. Um, nevertheless, we take patients with all indications, all classes um, for that procedure when it's indicated and for those people who are uh, most clearly suffering from atrial fibrillation. But really that short paroxysmal pattern has the best um, possibility of success from an ablation procedure we can do very well for our persistent patients um, as well. So what is the patient experience when they come for a consult for atrial fibrillation, ablation start to finish? We begin in the office, we have that office consult. Before the procedure, we will ask you to have a CT scan or an MRI where we determine the exact size and shape of your atrial chambers. We'll use that information during our procedures. We stop any antiarrhythmic medication several days prior, usually stop the blood thinning medication one to two days prior. On the day of the procedure, we do it under general anesthesia. So the first thing you know is that you go to sleep. The next thing you know is that it's all over and we're waking you up. In the meantime, we've probably done a transesophageal echo. Let's pass an echo probe down the esophagus. Look at the heart from behind one more time, make sure there's no blood clots. And then it's four catheters from the groin. We go in through the veins of the groin, both sides, advance catheters up through the vein into the heart, thin the blood so those catheters can't cross, cause stroke, cross between the walls of those top chambers so we have catheters in both the right and left atria where atrial fibrillation can come from, and we perform our ablation procedure cauterizing regions of heart muscle that are supporting that rhythm um, with the goal of eradication. When we are done, the catheters come out, we reverse the blood thinners, we wake you up, you spend one night overnight in hospital with us, we expect you to go home feeling fine the following day. There's a three month blanking period. For the first three months following that procedure, any recurrence of atrial fibrillation, we're not gonna call a failure of the procedure. That's because the procedure is maturing and the heart chambers are a little bit irritable for just having undergone this. Beyond three months is when we look for that lasting success of the ablation procedure. We're hoping you feel better, that we can start cutting back on the medications, hopefully eliminating the antiarrhythmic medications and have you free from atrial fibrillation. So again, very quickly, there's a CT scan. We get the size and shape of your atrial chambers, how the different veins and vascular structures insert into that chamber so we can perform your ablation for you in the best and safest way possible. We start with this image, we trim away the bones, the other vascular structures, prune down the vessels to the lungs until we have that dedicated cardiac chamber will, where we will be performing our ablation. Then as the ablation is performed, we see the procedure evolve with um, markings that we make at that, at that time. 
On your procedure day, again, here we are in our electrophysiology lab. The patient is laying here on the table. We have our echo machine, cardiac monitoring equipment, technical staff um, in the back room giving us feedback on how our procedure is performing. And we are using ablation catheters, fine tubes like spaghetti that advance through your veins into your heart. Here is the ablation catheter in a patient's heart. This is in contact with the heart muscle. It senses electrical activity, applies heat energy to electrically disrupt the electrical function of the heart muscle that it comes in contact with. That's the ablation catheter. Our second main catheter is this mapping catheter, and you can see that it's kind of shaped like a starfish that's very electrically sensitive, and we can paint around your heart chamber like a big paintbrush and sample the electrical activity at each point in that heart chamber, decide which areas are most contributing to the arrhythmia so we know where to go with the ablation procedure to complete your procedure. As the catheters move through the heart, a magnetic system records where they are. We recreate the heart chamber with our catheters. Um, so we know that we've covered those chambers completely. Comparing it to the CT scan, um, we're very systematic and we can be very thorough having all of this technology available. If you are in a paroxysmal pattern of atrial fibrillation, our ablation strategy is really to go around the veins that insert into the left atrial chamber. And as that pattern of atrial fibrillation becomes more persistent or longstanding, the amount of ablation that we do tends to increase. So here we see each of these little balls point by point as we've moved that ablation catheter through the heart chamber in circulating these venous structures that insert into that left atrial chamber, electrically isolating um, those veins as the backbone to our um, ablation procedure. We're very good at what we do. We pride ourselves on what we do. We have published from our lab at Cadillac in journals, in our professional field, helping labs in other settings adopt some of our techniques to achieve some of the results that we're experiencing. And it's been very thrilling to remain on the cutting edge. There's another technology for ablation that can be used. It's called the cryo balloon. Instead of that ablation catheter going point by point around the veins, we can advance this balloon into each vein, this balloon that then gets filled with electrical, uh, with liquid nitrogen that freezes the tissue surrounding that vein, electrically isolating that vein. And it's another option for performing a very similar ablation procedure, in this case using cooling um, rather than heating. So just to be aware. Many of our patients with atrial fibrillation have what we call tachybrady or the fast slow syndrome. And that means when you're in normal rhythm, many of our patients will have inappropriately slow heart rates during normal rhythm, um, which is very interesting. Your problem is either too fast, but when you're not too fast, you really are too slow. In those situations, our patients often do require pacemakers. Individual, individuals with pacemakers or defibrillators um, can have restoration of normal ranges of heart rates, and those pacemakers then perform that detailed monitoring function um, that we like. Um, so we always know continuously what the heart rhythm is doing in patients who have progressed to these devices. My favorite pacemaker in this setting is the Biotronic pacemaker. I believe it has the most physiologic way of understanding what heart rate your body wants and providing it to you. And it does that by sensing the contractility of the muscle in the heart, and the more forcefully the heart's contracting, the faster you probably want to go. And the pacemaker compensates um, very nicely to speed you up. Here we have a 90-year-old man with atrial fibrillation, profound bradycardia, you know, on a ambulatory monitor for 30 days prior, he spends 85% of his time less than 60 beats a minute. In the presence of a pacemaker, he's now spending 90% of his time greater than 60 beats a minute, even going up to 100 beats per minute at times. And again, we have that continuous monitoring system um, for atrial fibrillation that um, the pacemaker provides. So being able to treat the slow as well as the fast to best normalize your heart rate and to um, keep you in normal rhythm. There's another pacemaker system which can try to stop your episodes of atrial fibrillation. When they are detected, that pacemaker can burst pace into that atrial fibrillation, try to break that rhythm, get you back into normal rhythm. We've had some success with that, and um, it's certainly an option that's available um, for the appropriate um, individual. 
So here we see this atrial fibrillation being recorded in the top chamber of the heart. The pacemaker then deliver a bursting train of impulses in an attempt to stop that rhythm. Um, in this case, it was unsuccessful and the atrial fibrillation continued, but it will look for opportunity to do that again, and it can, in fact, be uh, quite successful. So one of our clinical cases, achieving rhythm control with a combination of Ticacin, that's the antiarrhythmic medication, followed by ablation. It's a 64-year-old male. He does have some coronary disease. He's had a stent. Overall, his heart is structurally quite normal. He's having atrial fibrillation, which he believes is giving him a profound and debilitating fatigue, although he can't tell it's there otherwise. In the presence of Ticacin, his burden of atrial fibrillation was reduced to 35%. And interestingly, the monitor could tell us that the majority of his episodes began 9 o'clock at night. And his wife could say, once we had this information, that's exactly when I typically lose him. It's about 9 o'clock in the evening. He kind of fades out. He's not as responsive or alert. It's 9 o'clock that his atrial fibrillation is starting. And then we can prove that that fatigue he is having is, in fact, due to uh, his atrial fibrillation. So that becomes very important knowledge for us for this individual, because then we can say, well, if we can get rid of the atrial fibrillation with ablation, we can quite reliably eliminate that fatigue that you are experiencing. So we took him to an ablation. Um, very interestingly, during our ablation, his atrial fibrillation suddenly stopped. It's always very satisfying when that happens. And in this person, we were unable to get that um, rhythm to start again post-procedure. And in fact, following his procedure, he's had absolutely no atrial fibrillation. And we'll get that from his monitoring device where we see all of the episodes that he was having prior to that procedure. And then at the time of the procedure and beyond, really nothing. And he's doing um, very well and very happy for, for the result that we fortunately were able to achieve for him. So we have all these fancy therapies. And you say, well, what, what else can I do? You know, what can I do on my own? And we are recognizing that lifestyle is very important in atrial fibrillation. This has been studied, again, by the Australian group. Aggressive risk factor modification improves the long-term success of ablation and atrial fibrillation in general. What do we mean by risk factor modification? If we take care of high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, alcohol excess, and sleep apnea, if we can improve with rate reduction, blood pressure control, sugar control in diabetics, and cholesterol control, we can reduce atrial fibrillation and improve procedure outcomes. So it kind of looks like this. Here's a patient. He has hypertension, diabetes, obesity. These risk factors for atrial fibrillation. This causes the heart to change, promotes atrial fibrillation. We take that person for an ablation. Wonderful but he continues to have high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, and that substrate for atrial fibrillation persists. Therefore, he's likely to have atrial fibrillation to recur post-ablation, which limits the success of his procedure. If we help this person control their blood pressure, lose weight, improve their sugar control, the heart is gonna start to heal such that after we perform our ablation procedure, the substrate is also improving in a way which our overall procedure result is more effective. The procedure lasts longer, it worked better. Not because we did a better job versus not, but because this person's also working on improving their lifestyle in all of those important ways. So risk factor modification, decreasing atrial fibrillation frequency, duration, and symptom severity, a five-fold greater success from ablation procedures in those patients who are also pursuing those lifestyle changes and not just showing up for, for their procedure. We can all avoid triggers like travel where we're overtired, there's stress, changing sleep patterns, Stress in general is like a shot of adrenaline which can provoke atrial fibrillation. The holidays are dangerous, St stress, fatigue, often increased alcohol. There is air pollution, more episodes when pollution is high, fine particles in the air, stress our hearts, provoke the arrhythmia. We have to be cautious of dehydration. 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 When we get behind on our water, this is very stressful to our body. It changes the electrical electrolytes in our blood, which um, really promote um, electrical stability in the heart. 
medications and drugs, over-the-counter cough and cold medications can be very stimulating for vocational fibrillation. Also, marijuana and cocaine for individuals who are doing these things can um, provoke a fib. Marijuana may be legal, doesn't mean it's good for your heart. And um, also medical procedures, if you have the stress of a surgery or something else, um, this can be very stressful to your heart, producing atrial fibrillation. So we always encourage our patients to improve on their comorbid conditions. If you're overweight, high blood pressure, diabetes, sleep apnea, asthma, preserve healthy gums and teeth, joint disease and inflammation, um, try to minimize this, psychological stress, try to work on your reaction to stress, addressing all of these things can improve on your response to atrial fibrillation. Positive lifestyle choices are a plant-based whole food diet, Mediterranean diet, stop eating when you're 80% full, because you probably are already full. Exercise 30 to 60 minutes, five days per week. You can do cardiovascular exercise, core strengthening exercises, sleep eight hours a night, get good quality sleep, hydration, drink filtered water, don't just drink out of the tap. We want to remove any heavy metals that are there. They're very aggravating to your heart. Remove, avoid carbonated beverages because they'll take magnesium out of your system and that's electrically un, un destabilizing. Sunlight, 10 to 20 minutes a day on your limbs. Um, very helpful for vitamin D. Supplement with vitamin D in the winter when you can't have sunlight. We ask people, patients to abstain from smoking, minimize caffeine, minimize, really abstain from alcohol. And if you are going to drink alcohol, please choose a high quality red wine because of its resveratrol content, some cardioprotective benefit from um, red wine. Atrial fibrillation friendly exercises. Cardiologist from the Cleveland Clinic tells us most people with atrial fibrillation should be able to find an exercise they can do safely and work up to about 30 minutes of exercise on most days of the week. That can be walking, start with 10 to 15 minutes, build up to 30 to 45. Jogging, if you feel walking is um, too simple for you. Cycling, little stress on the joints, good with arthritis, can use a stationary bike, become independent of the weather, lots of fun. Swimming is excellent, resistance in every direction of your motion. Um, swim at a comfortable pace for 30 minutes, do water aerobics. It's another excellent form. Core training. I've, asked, I've shown several patients Pilates as well as bar method DVDs that they can use to uh, increase their strength, work from the comfort of their home. These are very excellent choices. Any cardiovascular program should include some strength training with light weights or resistance bands. So get a few five pound weights or three pound weights and include some resistance training as part of your exercise program. These aerobic exercise machines are also very good for this, and you can adjust the intensity. It becomes a total body workout, both cardiovascular and a strength training program. Do it indoors, we can't blame the weather. It brings us to a another important topic, and that is nutritional supplementation. After we've done all of these healthy lifestyle ch changes, um, what other things can we benefit from? And often I'll present my patients with options for nutrition supplements that are available at health food stores and drug stores in the area. And these are some regimens that can be recommended for any cardiac condition. I'm encouraging many of my patients to take coenzyme Q10, also additional magnesium. Vegetarians can think about L-carnitine. There is D-ribose, which is a structural sugar, helps your body make its energy currency molecule, can actually help you feel better. And fish oil. Good omega-3 fatty acids can also be very electrically stabilizing in the heart. So many of my patients will be on regimens of this nature. Numerous patients report feeling better. Some have canceled their ablations for atrial fibrillation because they started taking coenzyme Q10 and the rhythm got so much better. And for those people, I'm just happy for them. If that's all you needed, then an ablation procedure would have been inappropriate for you because your heart was obviously just a little bit behind on its energy, and by replacing some of these things, um, we're able to get a much better result for those, for those people. Everything in the healthy category, I take myself every morning, including this morning, and um, I do believe that that is um, benefiting me at that time, and it's part of my long-standing health regimen going forward. 
there's a couple of books I like. They're sort of written for patients, reversing heart disease, tips for keeping your heart in rhythm. I've presented a lot of those options today. Um, nevertheless, you can read them in more detail if you choose. And finally, to summarize, atrial fibrillation. This is common and it is increasing. Symptoms can range from unrecognized to bothersome to debilitating. Palpitations are the classic symptom. Fatigue is, in fact, the most common system. We have a management triad. It always begins with anticoagulation whenever blood thinning medication is appropriate. We first think about rate control, slowing your heart down during atrial fibrillation with beta blockers, diltiazem, digoxin. To keep you in normal rhythm, we can attempt rhythm control with antiarrhythmic drugs. Favorite choices are propafenone, sotalol, ticosin. If these measures are inadequate, we can progress to catheter ablation. One-time procedure, goal to get you into normal rhythm and to keep you there, can be very satisfying. It's something we love to do and pride ourselves on greatly. And we'll always recommend lifestyle improvements, improving diet. We can always work on our diet. Even myself, I can work on improving my diet. Exercise, additional lifestyle choices, nutritional supplements um, can really be the magic bullet for certain individuals. Together, we will find what's best for you. And that's the important thing. Every individual deserves to be considered as an individual um, as we work through the range of solutions that are available to us to find the best result for that um, individual person. And finally, thank you very much to our sponsors today. Our program today is possible because of Biotronic, a company that I partner with very closely. And um, we're all grateful for um, the opportunities that they've given us to, to learn more about atrial fibrillation. So thank you very much. It's been a fantastic group. I uh, really appreciate you being here. Honestly, I do. And uh, any questions, I'd be happy to take questions.